can I get a show of hands of everyone who's found themselves in director jail? All right. What's director jail again? <laughs> <laughs> it's when you can't get a gig. Hi, I'm Mikey O'Connell of The Hollywood Reporter and welcome to THR's Director's Roundtable. We have such a truly impressive group collected here today. I'm so excited, so we're gonna get right into it. Paris Barkley from Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story. Liz Garbus from Yellow Jackets. Peter Hoare from The Last of Us. Karen Kusama from both Dead Ringers and Yellow Jackets. We have Mark Mylod from Succession, and we have Jake Schreier from Beef. In television, unless it's a pilot, your jobs often mean going into other people's workplaces and telling them what to do. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have a party trick for getting them to trust you or at the very least kind of liking you. <laughs> That's to anyone. Peter, you laughed, why don't you go? Well, I, I was gonna say, I'm nice to them, um, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I like if if, if, uh, if I want something from somebody, it's generally better to be nice to them, I think. So I smile and I ask people questions and then I listen to mm. the, the answers. And that seems to, to, to go down quite well. Uh, <laughs> particularly the actors, I find sometimes it's, a, it's so strange how many times people say, oh, it's really nice. Um, you know, the, the last director didn't talk to me at all. Um, OK, but um, but like we're all here to, to change that now. But uh but yeah, you know, it's it's it seemed you know we are all human beings and we do a ridiculous job and uh, I love my job by the way, but it, it can be ridiculous and uh, and it should be fun. So so yeah, make it more fun. I have a parlor trick, Mikey. Yeah, it started during COVID because of the masks. I wanted to meet via Zoom with every principal actor before. And now I just keep doing it and I'll do it forever for every show. Mm -hmm. So sometime in prep, I'll have, I'll say it's 20 minutes, but sometimes they go as long as an hour and a half, say Evan Peters. Um, <laughs> but I want to have a conversation with them. I want to talk to them about who they are and how they're approaching the role and tell them who I am and how they like to be directed. And I get so much good information. And then we come on the first day of the set and I'm sort of already preloaded with information about them, which helps me to do what I have to do, which is not to manipulate them, but to move them gently in the direction of the vision that we that we all share. So that's been my relatively new thing that I've started doing, but I'm going to keep doing it. Actually, I'm now thinking back, Paris, to the DGA um, seminar you ran on television, episodic television directing. And you did, you actually mentioned that about talking to people and asking them, you know, what had worked for them really well, like what had put them on their best foot forward um and i've i've i guess i've stolen that trick paris because it does it does you does just end up revealing like it's a great like icebreaker and it ends up revealing just a lot about how that person works best and feels best and that you can kind of just get right in there and support them in that way liz you stepped into a show with a very distinct visual style in yellow jackets one that was established by karen and I'm wondering, where do you find the opportunities to put in a personal touch and and where do you bump up against the parameters of house style? And and I guess, did you two discuss that uh, before your episode? Well, yeah, for, I mean, Karin created just an incredible world um, that's just been so mesmerizing with yellow jackets. And I think, you know, when I when I come into a show, I'm I'm sort of become a student of it. And I look at, you know, what what really worked well, what I think worked less well. Um, and I will, you know, go in there and have those conversations with the showrunner. Um, I think for me, it's thinking about the episode that I directed, you know, it was kind of this, this ongoing tension between um, the spiritual world and the rational world, which are always those two themes are constantly <laughs> in, in, entangled with one another on Yellow Jackets. So for me, it was about you know, what is a visual style? And there's also sort of a, a trick <laughs> in the episode that I directed that, um, you know, that we sort of plant Easter eggs um, for throughout. So I think for me, it was about developing a style that spoke to those two themes for that episode, the rational and the spiritual. So that was through a combination of production design and, you know, handheld, which, you know, originally the, um, there's sort of a dream sequence in my, in my episode. And originally um, I had heard that they weren't using handheld in season two of Yellow Jackets. And I just pushed back on that a little bit. So I think, you know, in shows where the showrunners listen and are open, you can um, have your 
visual um, dreams come true um, when you can justify them and thematically support them. So it's always that dialogue between like yourself as a director and what you hope to accomplish, but making sure it lives within the world of the show that the showrunners are um, responsible for executing overall. Mark, Steven Spielberg wrote you a letter of praise for an early succession episode in which he said, directing a dinner party is like fighting a bear and you won. Um, gatherings like a dinner party are baked into almost every episode of Succession and a dinner party is also the premise of your recent film, The Menu. So I was wondering what it says about you that you keep picking fights with bears. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure the table is a common denominator. Um, I, um, I very kind of belatedly realized that even though I like to think that every next kind of production I chase is really different from the last. There's actually this common denominator of of families or, or some kind of incarnation of family, even when it's not necessarily literal. Um, yeah, I really get excited about big groups of people that, that the, because they're so, that to to use your word, Liz, the entanglement of, um, of tensions is just really interesting. Um, and I, I suppose I feel a bit naked sometimes if it's if the screen is bereft of humans. Um, I'm always a bit insecure about that. When I have friends who direct things where it's, you know, I, if you ask me to direct Castaway, I would just have a panic attack, really. Um, um, I, 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 I'm just really naturally interested in dynamics in groups, I think. Um, I have no idea why. Who else among you has had a sort of pinch me version of a, of a Spielberg letter? Well, I didn't get it directly, but it came to Craig Mazin, uh, the writer of of the episode I did on Last of Us, or all of the episodes, and he shared it with myself and Nick um, Offerman and Murray uh, Bartlett and uh, Evan Bolter. And so basically a whole group of middle-aged men started squealing uh, because their idol had had realised who they were. So, um, I mean, I think he probably knew who everyone else was, but he didn't know who I was. And now he's probably forgotten. But the point is, at one point in my career, he did. It's the, the the most extraordinary tonal switch in a season in a series that I think I've ever seen in my life. Peter, I remember watching it and with the rest of the country, just being jaw on the floor. I could not believe how cold it was. It was absolutely incredible. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. I couldn't believe my luck. I mean, I know it's not all luck, but uh, but yeah, you know, I, I was signing on to do a a game, a show based on a game which I loved, and. Um, and then the script came and I was like, oh, no zombies, but. <laughs> and it was the but that really hooked me, uh, obviously. And uh, yeah, and I think sometimes we, you do think, OK, you put your faith in everybody, you know, certainly with, with Craig, who's so, so, so talented and gifted and funny and warm and, and human. And so, of course, he got all of the things that Last of Us needed to be. But yeah, you just sort of think, is this going to go down well? I know there were there were worries. Neil Druckmann, the, the show uh, the, the game creator was like, I think the fans might get divided on this. And there were definitely people I had, uh, I think I got my favorite review ever from the Christian review or Christian <laughs> who were, it's one of the most damning things I think of my, my whole career, but I will get that framed one day because it was <laughs> fabulous. Well, well let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as a gay man who's been together with the same person for 25 years, Imagine watching this episode and mm -hmm. just feeling completely emotionally devastated. I thought it was one of the most moving things I'd seen in my entire life. It felt like we were seeing our life before, during, and after. Mm -hmm. And then when I got the response from people who aren't gay people in a relationship mm -hmm. of 25 years, that you've managed to make it connect. You and Craig managed yeah. to make it connect to all sorts of people, you know, no matter where they came from and no matter what their background, because the love was so palpable and grew yeah. over time in such a moving way. And I just, I mean, I could do a whole hour and a half just asking you questions about that <laughs> because I thought it was really, you know, not just exceptional filmmaking, but really a, a moment kind of in history uh, for television and for representation and just for broadening the tent of what what this medium could do um, with our hearts, basically, not just with information, but with our hearts. So I just I can't say enough about it, but I think it's uh, you know, you have to talk about me, too, sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I hope this is so I'm going to save this as well, put this on the wall. Uh, <laughs> So thank you. Thank you all very much. There's one other thing that I just really like, just on a craft level, apart from all those beautiful things that Paris has just said, and that's the way you've found a way 
in to transition through time. Um, I always think that time jumps are, are like the they're like the enemy e- enemy of connecting with the characters, aren't they? Because every time you you take any kind of time jump, it's it's like you've got to grab the audience and recapture them. But you did it so deftly that, that when you moved through all those decades. I never felt anything but connected to the characters. And I, I've, I've no idea how you did that. I want to rewatch it. Back. Um, but it's absolutely brilliant, mate. Thank you. That's very kind. Maybe I don't know how I did it as well sometimes, but 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 what we do is a bit of magic, isn't it? And and when we get lucky with the script and we feel something we haven't felt before, we're like, don't, don't drop it. Don't, you know, don't drop it. Don't, don't screw it up. And uh, and I just think everybody was so invested. Everybody really wanted this to to do well so i had a great team no paris you said you wanted to talk about you and i do too uh you've said that there were days on the Dahmer set that were so heavy and dark that you cried when you got home and i was just wondering how do you rally not just to go back to the material and to do your job but to be a leader on set when you're in such like really heavy material yeah that's a question i always dread um <laughs> because it brings me back. It, you know, I didn't want to do it in the first place. I just told Ryan no when he called me about it. I just, but it seems like the things that I've often said no to have been the most successful in my career. I said no to Jimmy Smith's final episode of NYPD Blue when I was a young director. I just said, I don't want to do that. I can't. Um, but mm-hmm. eventually I get conned into it. And this was one of those cases where Ryan convinced me that the show was really about Tony Hughes. This was the point where the the series was going to turn its focus on the victims, the impact, society's failings, the failings of the police, the system failing these people. And by using Tony Hughes, one particular character to do that, he just entrusted me with doing that. And and that person being a gay black man who uh, cannot hear made it even more poignant for me because I'd never told a story like that. And just like I was saying with with uh, The Last of Us, it was so specific that it became completely universal. I mean, I related to Tony not just because of the common similarities, but the aspirations and the hopes and the dreams this kid had, you know, in which we spent 20 minutes in the beginning of the show, you know, explaining and talking about before you ever saw him meet Jeffrey Dahmer. So that helped me. But as it got increasingly dark, I'm just like, I'm sure everyone will agree. I'm just a super sensitive guy, which is, I think, one of the reasons why I ended up in this job. I have like tentacles that absorb very, you know, just vibrations from everyone. And therefore, if things like this, if we're talking about a madman and a lunatic who is dismembering these gay men, it's there's no way that I can't feel all the reactions of everyone in the set. The second second that I see crying, you know, at some point affects me. And and Evan Peters, who went through a lot, you know, just personally, it's tough for him to to do this. I feel for him, too. So I just become a wreck. I just I meditate a lot to try to get out of those feelings. But it's just when I'm in that process, I'm going to be kind of open to everybody. And it's both painful but essential to to what I do. So I, I, you know, tears in my pillow were just part of the price I had to pay to get up. But I did keep focusing on the eight characters who are disabled and representing them well and being really, really secure in what I thought that show was about, which is these victims have been overlooked for years and their stories have not been told. So I was basically on the fuck Jeffrey Dahmer team. Let's really show the humanity of these people that he killed and make people feel that. That's why the episode began with the birth of this of this boy. It began with his very beginning. Every time a kid gets shot in a school, I think about his mother and the day he was born and how that happened and the family he leaves behind. So I think telling those stories as deeply as possible does really do a service as difficult as they are to get through. So Paris, you're dealing with Evan Peters in character as one of America's most infamous serial killers, even after you say cut, like I imagine you're steering people away from him at craft services. Uh, Mark, we, we've we all read about the varying degrees of, of method that, that Jeremy Strong embraces. Who else among you have, have dealt with character or actors who don't break character? And, and how do you navigate with that with the other performers? That's not really true of Evan Peters. He is intense and he does largely stay in character, but he's not crazy. <laughs> no, I mean, I didn't mean that you thought he was crazy, but I think that's sort of out there. Like he's suddenly become Dahmer and he's actually eating people for lunch. It's not that. 
it's he's you can talk to him you can direct him he is open to that he's he's you know there he has ears he, he has feelings but in order to perform that's just what he needs he needs to be in his earphone cocoon to focus and i just respect that but he's also hilarious and also fun i just think and maybe this is true of, of jeremy too i i think the story becomes that they're just sort of lunatics in their own minds but it's really not quite that he's he's there for the other people as well as for the character jake beef beef was at least billed as more of a comedy but it it does go to very dark places. Uh, with Ali and Steven have said they broke out in hives after the shoot. When you're seeing actors clearly impacted by this material, uh, particularly in the case with these two, how do you sensitively push them to hold on to whatever it is they need to do to deliver these performances? I mean, to some degree, you know, I admit probably they're breaking out in hives because they're so committed to that. You know, I certainly didn't feel like I had to do anything to keep Stephen. I mean, Stephen refuses to be false in any given moment. And that's partly why, you know, they had to go to that place. I think it's more just about, and, and you know, to the previous question, and I've worked with Jeremy Strong, who's definitely not a lunatic. And, you know, I worked <laughs> with Jim Carrey for uh, six episodes. And, you know, he's not method, but he certainly is extremely committed. I think like one of the the fun parts about the job, and especially in TV, we're getting to work with so many different sets of actors and so many different processes is that, you know, everyone has their own different process. And from my perspective, that's really none of my business, you know, like how Jeremy gets there versus how Jim gets there versus how Ali gets there. It's whatever, as long as we can all show up in the moment and then use the script as that kind of shared language to discuss like what these characters are looking for. Like I always really trust that the actors have found their way in to how to do that. And then if they need help, then that's sort of what I'm there for. And, or just help in all sort of aligning in what we're looking for in, in those moments. But yeah, I never felt like, I mean, one of the joys of Beef is that, you know, Stephen and Allie are friends with Sunny who created it and were so involved in, in creating those characters before we ever got on set, you know, that there was this true level of commitment and there was no going back to trailers and everyone hung out and it really felt like more of a family experience on set. Karin, how did you find yourself engaging with Rachel Weiss on the Dead Ringer set, given how often your actress was sharing scenes with herself, um, playing two just startlingly different characters? She really sold it. Uh, do you treat her differently depending on the character? How did that dynamic work for you? It's interesting because I've actually worked, uh, I've, I had, before working with Rachel, I had worked on my husband's show, um, The Mysterious Benedict Society, in which there were twins. And so I was becoming a little bit more just sort of um, aware of the the issues technically with shooting with the same actor playing two characters. And Rachel is this wonder of a human. Um, she's so relaxed. Um, she's so prepared. And I don't know how anyone can drink as many cups of tea as she does and not completely like have some kind of cardiac event. But um, but she manages to just be the most even person. And then she's a really amazing example of somebody who is so uh, completely different from the character she was playing in Dead Ringers. I mean, um, you know, she she is not one of two psychopathic <laughs> twin gynecologists. Um, and and yet what I was really struck by was how um, there must have been some kind of internal playbook for her where the difference between Beverly and Elliot, the two twin sisters that she plays, were so precise and so present that I never had, it's almost like I never felt like I was dealing with an actor I was always dealing with Beverly and then we would she Rachel would go away and do a costume change and a hair and makeup change and and then I'd be working with Elliot um I, it's just still astonishing to me how completely dialed in Rachel is as both of those characters and so she made it easy to be honest I mean she really is just an extraordinary actor I mean, in terms of the visuals, we have come a long way since The Parent Trap. It's just so, so convincing. Um, I guess for all of you, uh, what was a time 
uh, in your career where you felt like you were taking your biggest risk? Well, every film or job has its own, you know, risk inherent. And, you know, like what what Paris said is the, the shows that he said no to are the ones that end up being the most rewarding in some ways. I think when we're sort of out on that limb um, a little bit without our safety net or comfort zone is when we can sort of feel the most anxious and inspired or myself anyway. Um, and I like I like that. I mean, there have been so many moments for me where I've, um, you know, obviously I've, I've have a long history in documentary. Um, and then I made my first scripted film with Netflix and lost girls. That was a huge moment. And then directing on the handmaid's tale, which was my first, um, television job and sort of walking into this. Um, it was, it was, um, you know, walking into this set where there's a whole new, I mean, learning the rules of how TV works and understanding the roles and like who I could be as a director within that um, world of The Handmaid's Tale led by the extraordinary Elizabeth Moss and thinking about, you know, dark material and, and you know, what I got to do on Handmaid's Tale. But for me, I mean, it's been every time I've stepped out of my um, comfort zone, um, which has been many times because as I've worked across genres and, um, but I like that feeling. It just makes me feel inspired and alive and challenged. And it kind of can bring out the best of me. And Mikey, I had the opposite experience of Liz. After Dahmer, um, I started doing a documentary, a feature documentary on Billy Preston. And so now here I am. So I realize how dependent I've been on brilliant writers and scripts when suddenly it's interviews <laughs> and archival footage and music, and it has to be put into some semblance of a story and you have to somehow coalesce it all. And I thought of you, Liz, and I just thought, I thought this was a lot easier. <laughs> and now well, we're a week away, two years later, we're a week away from locking picture down. The picture's fantastic. And the Billy Preston story uh, I discovered is completely different from what I began thinking it would be, which I understand, Liz, is the experience of many a documentary. And you start with this premise and this idea of what your movie's gonna be. And as you go through the process, it becomes what it is, which is something else. And I just think I was initially very uncomfortable with that. I like to know the ending. I like to know what are the themes and how does this come together? But it's not until the end of the ride that you discover that in a documentary and now we're refining it. So uh, I, I think jumping out of my comfort zone by going into a genre that I'd never you know, touched before really other than some music video style documentaries, was very, very risky, but I would do it again, Liz. I'm, I would do it again because it was an extremely different, interesting ride. It is, but, but there's also so much that's analogous. In the documentary edit room, of course, you're kind of taking this mold of messy clay and you're trying to make something beautiful out of it. And, you know, with the script, it's sort of like you have this beautiful thing, right? Like you have this, we're going to go with the clay, like vase thing. Like you have this vase, right? Then you get all the clay on set, right? And then you're kind of trying to put it back together. In the doc, it's the messy clay. But like the editing process and the storytelling process, I find are really deeply analogous, right? Because it's all, you know, it's all it's all in the service of telling a story, right? That's something that I've, I've enjoyed so much on, on docs myself. But anyway, I'm really excited to see that film, Paris. <laughs> yeah, soon. Peter, you mentioned that your episode of Last of Us was considered a big risk amongst the creative team. Um, I was wondering, as a gay man shooting a script that's essentially a two-hander play about two gay men, one written by a straight man, I was wondering if there was anything that you pushed to shift or change that was in that original script. Um, well, no, because I, I, I think I touched on it before. Um, but I mean, Craig may be straight, but Craig has got the warmest heart uh, that he basically all he needed to write the story. And I think that's partly why it is, is so universal, because his attention was on the, the love rather than the gender, um, if that makes sense. I've had many conversations about the character of Bill and everyone goes, well, Bill's a gay man. I was like, well, is he? He could be, but he hasn't really defined himself in those words. Um, he's never had the opportunity to 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 meet to 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 you know examine himself he's never had this experience it doesn't quite sit the same as if it were a, a simple gay love story there's a lot more going on and i feel like just basically you know uh craig wrote from what he knew as a has he'd been in a relationship in a marriage for some number of years he knew the things that categorized the success or failure of of a relationship and that's what went in and and they're universal everybody experiences those things 
uh, one of the, the the best moments I think in terms of telling that story is going from their first sexual experience to a huge row. And it's like, you know, six years later or something, it's like, boom, there you go, we're on. Uh, the story's moved. And and I think, yeah, again, that's, that's what really came across. And I wanted that to come across. I didn't want it to feel that it was only one group of people's story, you know? I think if it had been, it wouldn't have been as successful. Mark, Brian Cox continued to go on set after his character's death, the episode that you directed, and, and you directed his character's funeral episode in the finale. He said he did this at least in part to prevent spoilers, but we also know that he was he was sad to leave the show. What was it like having him on set after he was no longer really fulfilling a job? Um, it was lovely, obviously. Um, there's you know, when we were saying goodbye to him and, and when we told him that, that the character was dying, you know, relatively early in the season, um, we felt bad about that. And obviously he did. I think his expectation, well, I know it was that he would, you know, that his character would probably pop his clogs much later. Um, so he was a little bit discombobulated by that, I think. Um, and I can't speak for him, but I'm sure as he'd psyched himself up for, you know, six months of, uh, you know, seven months shooting on the season and, and suddenly it wasn't that that it was nice to be around us and it was certainly lovely for us when you've got an actor of that caliber and that gravitas um and we we were all obviously sad to leave him and and on, on a work level insecure about carrying on without him without that you know kind of centrifugal force at the heart of the of the tension and the dynamic um so it was, there was something lovely and reassuring about having him around a couple of times it was slightly surreal when he turned up at his funeral um but uh um but mostly it was just lovely to have him there um can i get a show of hands of everyone here who's ever found themselves in director jail all right <laughs> okay. oh we got a half we got a half hand um all right we could go around but like how did you find yourself there and just as important how did you claw your way out What's okay. director's jail? What's director's jail again? I <laughs> it's when you can't get a gig. It's a fail. Oh, it's a fail oh. Program. oh okay. I, I made a horrible pilot when I first came to the States. I took on a pilot, which I won't name, which I should never have done. Um, mm. Because with all the brilliance of writing, I mean, this if ever, you know, if ever this was the learning curve for me in this particular experience was um just make sure you love the script. Um, and I, I've done that ever since. I've made sure I've worked with writers who are incredible. Um, and if the writing is incredible, chances are you're not going to mess it up. Um, or it's a brilliant safety net at the very least. Um, but in this occasion, I didn't. Um, the script wasn't ready to go. And, uh, and I was bland and vanilla in my choices and consequently so was the pilot so it quite rightly didn't go forward um and um yeah and i found it difficult to get a job for after a while it was coming out the back of the writer's strike so things were still the the, the writer's strike 14 15 years ago um um and uh yeah i found myself in really a tricky situation there financially and and in terms of what the hell am I doing with my life it was a huge catalyst for me that and a terrible movie I made in this same year um to re-examine my choices and actually completely change direction away from trying to do straight comedy and trying to actually mm. gravitate towards things that I was terrified of I finally realized that I had to evolve as a storyteller instead of just staying in my comfort zone um, so ultimately, something good came out of it. Um, the thing that did come out of it, actually, to, to the second part of your question, how did I get out of it? It was to just pitch the heck out of doing the American version of Shameless. I'd already done the British version you know, eight mm -hmm. years previously, and then just making sure when I got that pilot, because pretty much nobody else was available, um, to just make sure it was as extraordinary as I could possibly make it. Um, and I was really hungry by then. I remained hungry. That's um, it's a big cliche. And we all know everybody on this meeting has been around long enough to know that as soon as we drop our guard, as soon as we don't give our all, then we then we fail. Hmm. I started in features and and still consider myself a feature director. But after my first indie film that was very much mine, I made a big studio sci-fi love story and at 
60 times the budget. And then another studio film uh, called Jennifer's Body. Um, and both of those films were considered failures at the time. And I hadn't really even considered the concept of how failure is as as much as I think it's a crucial part of the creative process, how that affects a career or slows a career down. And so um, it took me several years to actually get work in television. Uh, and it was the ability to start working on a, a, a small show at AMC called Halt and Catch Fire with um, brilliant, brilliant showrunners um, one of whom I work with on Yellow Jackets today, Jonathan Lisko, but but Chris Rogers and Chris Cranthwell, the young showrunners who started that show, they they gave me a chance, and um, I ended up directing an episode of every season of every season of the four seasons of that show, and that that was one of those experiences where it was just good to be working with a pretty aggressive budget and a super aggressive schedule, um, great actors, great scripts, an adventurous visual language that was still um, really exciting to me, um, spoke to me personally. And so I feel like television ended up helping me kind of reframe just the joy of making things, the joy of directing actors and um, doing the thing I actually feel I can do. And so that was that it was a great kind of uh, practice for me to be in episodic television for that time um, as I was building that part of my career. And then I was able to return to features and keep, keep directing TV and, and eventually do something like Yellow Jackets, which was a, a big kind of creative leap for me as well. I, I believe the first studio film you referenced was Eon Flux, and I, I'm going to quote something because I love it so much. Uh, after being fired and then asked to come back, an executive apparently said to you, I really hated your version of the movie, but believe it or not, I hate the new version even more. Uh, where does that rank among the backhanded compliments that you have gotten uh, in your Hollywood career? I mean, it's definitely it's definitely up there. Um, and in an interesting way, it 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 brings up, you know, the the elemental tension between what it is we all do on this Zoom in which we're just trying to make something that has a kind of emotional, narrative, visual, stylistic coherence versus I don't know, a throw something at the wall and see what sticks attitude, which I actually think can be very much what we're all dealing with um, beyond our creative teams, right? And so for me, it was great to get such lacerating um, feedback, let's call it, um, so early in my career because it, it helped me understand kind of what we're all up against and what, what it is, um, what we're all trying to defend and preserve in, in these uh, careers of ours. Does anyone else have any memorably appalling or, um, or, or helpful feedback that they'd like to share that they've gotten earlier in their careers? I got fired off my first directing job, but then, <laughs> um, then I pretended it hadn't happened and carried on. Um, there was a production meeting just before we shot the first episode of a, a thing called um, Shooting Stars, um, which was a kind of deconstructed game show. And I, because it was so cheap, I, I said, if I like do all the production stuff, can I also direct it? This was obviously in, in England. And, um, and a week before we shot the first one, we were sat around the production meeting and the producer said, yeah, great, Mark. Yeah, the, the boys, meaning the Vic and Bob, the two very funny comedians who were running the show, um, who were the stars of the show, um, they said the boys thought, yeah, maybe you do the other stuff, but maybe you shouldn't direct. Um, <laughs> whereas and there was about 14 people around the table and I could feel tears welling up in my eyes and going puce with embarrassment. And uh, and I just looked down at my little kind of table of that I was drawing on the piece of paper and just, no, no, I think I, I think I should direct. Anyway, item 12, <laughs> and I just walked 
and kind of wiping away the tears and got to the end of the meeting and kept waiting for the tap on the shoulder. But and um I outphased them. The belly they they did anything else. So I carried on and directed it and and it won lots of awards. So that was good. I'm trying to think. I mean, I think the first time I showed Frank Langella the first cut of Robot and Frank, it was like backstage. We were doing a play with Adam Driver in New York. And I showed it to him. I had written down somebody like took me to Sardis. He's like, let me show you what the old theater world is about, you know, and took me there and then just gave me this long list of notes about how nothing in the film worked at all that I still have written down. And I was like, okay, okay, I don't think it's that bad, but, you know, and then made some edits. I don't know if I changed everything based on what he said. And then it eventually came around to loving the thing. So that was nice. But I have the paper somewhere of the list of things that just absolutely were failing in the film. So that was a good thing to say. <laughs> Jake, you also just signed on to direct a giant Marvel movie. Uh, what does that call look like? And what is the mental calculation that gets you to a yes? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, John Watts, uh, who did all the latest Spider-Man movies, like we were roommates in college um, and I did second unit on the L.A. portion of the first one. So, I mean, I know those guys a little bit and had talked to them about a few movies in the past. And I think... Um, I think, you know, sort of on theme with, you know, Karen, what you were talking about, like I had a similar thing of nothing that I would regard as maybe director jail, but, you know, like the things that were, the doors that were opening up weren't right. And then had this very interesting experience going into TV and learning so much where, you know, you, you kind of, like I might not direct this way, but you're on a show called Kidding and it's a Michelle Gondry show and you get to, you know, if it was your own movie, you feel very protective at first in your career. This is who I am and this is what I do and I can't be that thing. And then you go into TV and it's, you're actually being asked to work in all of these different styles and understand craft from a, from a different perspective. And I think like at this, like where I'm at, just even the experience of getting to work on something that large, I mean, obviously it happened to be a very good idea for a film uh, that I was that I was drawn to, but it, but also just that experience of getting to work on something at that scale and get to, getting to try out all these different things like that that becomes attractive at some point where it's less about this is the the narrative that I'm writing of my career and more like what experience would I like to have like what would be interesting to work on who would I like to work with um, and that's kind of what did it for all of you the the big franchise movie has been um, the dominant narrative uh, for theatrical for quite some time. And I'm wondering, for directors, do you look at it as more the pinnacle or as an opportunity to open doors to other things that you you really want to do and maybe wouldn't um, get the vote of confidence to do otherwise? I'd like to think that it was about the story. I'm sure there, um, um, there, there is, um, you know, I haven't done that, that you know that scale of a project that that Jake's preparing. Um, um, my, I suppose, closest personal comparison is trying to get employed on Game of Thrones because I loved it so much. So, um, and um, and I loved the story, and I loved the dynamic, and I loved the combination of the epic and the intimate, um, and the the balance of that I thought was exquisite. So, and so that was the draw. But yes, there was also an element of. I would love to, you know, evolve my craft so that I can do a big battle, you know. Um, so that I, I suppose that was my experience. So I suppose they're symbiotic. I, I'm, I'm not sure what the lead would be between the two of them. How did you get on Game of Thrones? I basically um, badgered David and Dan, um, uh, the brilliant writers, um, and for a meeting, um, and then went to talk with them and. Um, in talking, uh, they asked me what my favourite scene was, and and it was, you know, obviously expecting that kind of wrote all that brilliant battle there. But actually, my favourite scene was a two hander um, between Cersei and and the king, um, talking about the failure of their marriage, um, and that was their favourite scene too. So there was a, I suppose they thought, okay, there's a guy that's, you know, that will pay attention to our relationships, and um, maybe you know the DPs will take care of the scale. Um, so it was a um, so that that was a connection really. It was just um, just a love of uh, yeah the ability to do such a grand scale, but still have such close attention to the minutiae of a relationship. Who else has badgered their way into a meeting? <laughs> I say badger. It's not like I kind of. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but who were the people in your career who you were just dying to collaborate with and you you wouldn't take no for an answer? Um, well, Craig Mason's one of them, but you know, Peter's, Peter's got the in now. I think he's a genius. Um, I'd love to work with him. Um, I suppose that that would be top of my wish list. Maybe Phoebe Waller Bridge as well. Um, there's the just writers, brilliant, brilliant writers who have such a humanity and such a brilliant, unique voice. I'm dying to work with Stephen Yoon. So, I mean, mm -hmm. Jake, you, you, but. Yeah. He, 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 uh, someday, he someday I'm going to be badgering him. Someday it, it will, he's going to be I like, can, when will this woman leave me alone? <laughs> I, I can tell you that it will not disappoint. I felt very, very lucky to just even really be there watching him work. Yeah. yeah. Harris, in your first decade in TV, it was very much considered a quote unquote writer's medium. And, and that narrative has obviously shifted. But I was wondering, what was the first major evidence in your, your own career and experiences that you felt that narrative was changing? Well, I don't know how much that narrative has changed. Um, I mean, oh. <laughs> you guys in the Hollywood Reporter certainly spend a lot more time promoting showrunners than you do directors. And that's why I'm so grateful for this panel. Uh, <laughs> I think it is shifting on some shows, certainly on the kinds of shows we work on where the director is valued, um, but it's not shifting you know, nationwide. Um, I, I do believe that probably the ER West Wing days of working with John Wells and Aaron Sorkin for me, where both of them really see the director as a collaborator, as an essential part. John didn't actually have writers on the set on ER at all. You were prepped like within an inch of your life. You had eight hour tone meetings. But then when it came to the set, you directed the show. And that was then. If you had a question, you had phone numbers and you would contact people. And that was sort of the trust that that I kind of grew up with. And a lot of that has changed now. Um, but I do believe that we add more than we take away and that our realizing role is deep. I mean, our realizing role is uh, is, you know, it's certainly not the equivalent of what the writers contribute in creating characters and creating um, the script in and of itself, because obviously we couldn't do anything without it. But by taking it from, you know, as they say, from the page to the stage, are, we're doing more than translating. We're infusing it with ourselves and with our choices. And those choices are myriad and many, from the height of the camera to whether this moves, to how this actor performs that particular line, to is this lid, is this backlit? Do we see them? Where are the extras? Are they in front of the camera? How does that make you feel? I mean, even in Dahmer, I said, hmm, I've got to minimize Jeffrey Dahmer here. So I'm going to keep shooting him in a 50-50 with Tony Hughes. And just that thing, which no one will really notice, but often the two of them are in a 50-50 as opposed to Dahmer and the victim. You know, there's their equivalents. And those are the choices that we make that often are invisible, but they affect how you receive the information. So while I'm hoping that television is evolving to be more than a director's medium, I think it is more so for an exclusive group of directors than for directors broadly, is what I'm basically saying. I thought that was really what felt special about Beef for me is that I've been friends with Sonny who created it for like six years and we would have talked about it whether I worked on it or not. But I assumed when I worked on it that it would probably end our friendship in the editing room at some point that he would want me out. And, you know, which is that even with showrunners that I get along well with, at some point you leave and they do what they do with the work. And I think, you know, it is very much Sonny's show and part of what's so nice about the response is just being friends with someone who has such a particular vision and getting to see that connect with so many people. But I think, you know, we're used to sort of, I mean, if you start in features and you're used to being more in charge and kind of look at it, yeah, TV is more the writer's medium. And I think it is. And yet somehow, like, I feel about as proud of Beef as I do anything that I've done where it was like, I directed the music video, I directed a feature. And yet I say that not feeling like, I took it over, it was mine, like it is still very much Sonny's show. And there's something nice about that, like if you can find that, and that's a very special relationship. And I think everyone here has probably been lucky enough to find that on their shows. And and Jake, I mean, just to kind of like fangirl for a second, I mean, what's really interesting about what you're saying is that that you are part of a collaboration so deeply that you have now made this incredibly specific expression of of a part of life that I don't actually think many of us have seen. I would I would venture to say, as an Asian American, I fi I finally saw the show that spoke to me in in some 
ephemeral way, actually, in a way that I couldn't understand how it worked. And so there's something really, um, I don't know, just beautiful about getting to be a part of such a specific vision by surrendering to the collaborative process. And I do think that can be a really interesting experience in television, particularly for all of us. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I mean, that was a very obviously, you know, and I could feel that from the first table read, but it, but it wasn't for me, right? You could feel like how much it meant to each of those actors that there was this show that felt very much kind of almost sort of inside or not speaking outwardly, or, you know, and that I think especially like one of Stephen's favorite weeks was we, we had a whole week of shooting at the church. And here I was directing most of this thing and I had no connection to the Korean church, obviously, you know, and, and your job really in that case is to let again, sort of let people bring themselves to it and kind of not get in the way, just try to frame that and shape it and let it be personal to all of the people involved. It sort of more just felt special to be there and watch it more than feel like you were the one making it, in a sense. All right. We're 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 obviously speaking. Um, during a writer's strike, the uh, directors have an upcoming contract negotiation. Paris, you were a DJ president for years. You currently serve as a co-chair of the outreach team. For all of you, what what's a priority um, that you'd like to see resolved in this this upcoming negotiation? What's important to you right now? What's important to your peers? Well, first, I can't speak for the DGA. I'm not the president yeah. anymore. It would be like Barack Obama criticizing <laughs> Joe Biden in any way. So I have no comment. And also, the DGA doesn't comment. Our negotiation negotiations are going ongoing now. But I can talk for me personally because I'm a member of the Writers Guild and the Directors Guild and SAG. So I can say now is the time that all of us really have to stick together to get what we deserve. And I think that's why you're hearing this unprecedented solidarity. The DJ has put out a number of statements before we went on our blackout into negotiations. Leslie has done, our president, Leslie Lincoln Ladder, has done a great op-ed where she really laid out the 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 places where we align. I think it's not just money at stake, although money is at stake, wages and streaming residuals. But I also think just the way we actually are treated in this new ecosystem um, is not working. At least it's not working for the creatives. And I think that's why you're seeing us banding together now to say it's got to stop. And if there's one thing that I think is the Writers Guild member of me that I'm super concerned about, it's AI. I just don't know where that ends. And I don't like it. Um, I know that for a director, I can't wait to see the AI version of that episode of The Last of Us. Um, I just think it'd be, it would have a hard time communicating to the actors exactly what the writer meant and setting up those beautiful shots and making me cry, but I guess it could try. Um, we have lots of provisions in the Directors Guild that says a director has to be a person, for instance, and a director would have to be a member of the Directors Guild, and I don't think computers are going to get into the Directors Guild super soon. I don't know. But for the writers, they can produce a lot of written shit using AI. And I, for one, am ready to say, I'm not doing that. That's my, that's the director of me. Why am I going to do something that's not generated by not a person? But the writers, the writer in me has a real fear that that will start to become the way many scripts are developed, that they'll take that whole season of Full House and turn it into the new Full House reboot and ask a writer to polish it and then put it out there and then ask me, a director or some director to direct it. And my answer, and I hope to encourage my fellow directors, is no. My answer is no. I want to work with human beings who I can discuss things with and who I can who have a stake in that which is written. So I think those are, the, to me, the big things that both sides of I me, mean, my writer's guild side and my DGA side, the C are at stake. It's the wages, it's the stream residuals, but it's also the rise of AI. Yeah, and it's not, and it's not just, I think for those of us who are working in this business, I mean, every episode that's represented in these boxes was, is, is indelible in audiences' memories because of the humanity infused by an extraordinary writer. And I do worry about the director, the director's piece of AI. I know that in Paris, you're saying there's no robots in, um, in uh, <laughs> allowed into the DGA, but I still yeah. think it's something directors need to be thinking about, you know, about like, you know, are, are they, is there gonna be a moment where AI is gonna be spitting out shot lists or, you know, things, you know, in order that that will, um, you know, I think there, there are things for the directors to be yeah. thinking about But if it's seriously. spit out a shot list, what would you do with it? If anyone presents you a shot list, what would well, you do? I mean, you would say, no, shut no. up your ass is what you would do. I would, I, right. I would cross a lot of things out. But I think that, <laughs> I mean, I think that, that the danger is, 
when you get people who who won't or when you're you know when you're not you know it, it it's 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 a concern that um the the studio's response to the very very reasonable ai demands um of the writers guild so yeah. i think that directors we need to be aware of that as well as a, i know we all are for our craft Karen, you're married to a, a writer and a, a showrunner. What are the conversations like at the dinner table these days? Um, you know, it's it's very. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to say grim, but <laughs> but there but there's a lot of there's a lot at stake right now, and you know, um, we've we've just watched you know Disney essentially flush most of their their produce shows um off of their own network um and i think we understand the 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 reasons why they want to do that in the short term but the the long term um implications of this kind of decision making is clearly not in the best interest of storytelling it's not in the best interest of the audiences who want those stories who love those stories and it's definitely not in the best interest of the people who make those stories, the writers, the directors, the actors, the crews. So I just think uh, it's a very consequential moment. And we talk a lot about a kind of existential cliff that we're all standing on. And we're very fortunate to feel like we traveled a long way to get here. Um, I'm really, really concerned for the people who, who've just gotten up on their feet, who are trying to build careers right now. Like, I really wonder what is going to be, um, what's going to be in their future. And so, um, for many of us in multiple guilds, what we are fighting for is not just our here and now and our paycheck today, but for everyone in this industry and art form in the future. In the interest of ending things a little more optimistically, uh, yeah, <laughs> you've hit us on a dark day. <laughs> even even with sort of industry wide contraction and and this strike and the potential for other strikes, we're still going to come out of this with like at least four hundred scripted shows on the air. The sandbox is huge right now. You talked about on-screen talent that you'd want to collaborate with, but what about, what shows would you want to come in and immerse yourself for a, a, a week or two that you haven't already? Succession, too late for that. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say that. Unfortunately, <laughs> he's killed it. <laughs> that would be on my list too. I just, I just love watching it. I just love trying to figure out what is the alchemy that got to this performance? How much of this is actually scripted? Because the way you put it together, it doesn't sound like it was even written by anyone. It just sounds like it's happening. And I just find that so fascinating. So that's one that I've been I've been loving after for, for a very long time. I also love a show called Industry, which not many people are watching except me, I guess. Really I just, good. It's yeah. really good and it's sexy and it's fascinating. I love the whole high finance of it. I do love, the, the, you know, the more intimate shows. I do love that sort of thing. So there's a number of those that I dream of. But then I would say in closing though, Mikey, there's a lot of optimism to be had. I mean, not only are more stories are being told, but more stories that matter are being told. And despite the fact that they may be upset that there's a transgender person holding a beer, we're not going down that road. We're putting all sorts of people in front of the camera. We're telling their stories and we're saying, this is the world that we want to see and we're helping to create it. So I think there's a lot to be proud of in this industry in the way that, that we tell our stories. And I don't think that's going to wane in the, in the future. Thank you all for joining me today. This was such a fantastic conversation. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks. Thank Mike. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Mikey.